Hi everyone, it's William from Arpeggio here, and we have a very special treat today. We have the principal trombone of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, none other than Mr. Toby Oft. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's start at the very basics. Um, what brought you to the trombone in the first place? Um, just the adoration of my dad. Uh, like any six-year-old boy, I idolized my dad, and he's uh, still an amazing gentleman in my eyes, but at the time, all I saw him do in his spare time was play trombone. He loved to listen to Tommy Dorsey and emulate Tommy Dorsey, and that's what he used to do after he would teach band all day at work. He would teach young people. He was a music educator. Um, so, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids, he'd teach them how to play beginning band all day, and then he'd come home and he'd practice trombone on our porch and then teach lessons, private lessons, and... So uh, I completely idolized that um, way of life that you would just practice in all your spare time. And at six years old, I decided that I was going to start practicing trombone like my dad. And he thought it was cute. So <laughs> <laughs> we ran with it. Well, it, you really did run with it. Uh, can you give uh, some, of our, some of our viewers some, a quick overview of, of your orchestral career? It took off really fast. Well, to me, it wasn't fast. <laughs> to me, it was it was frightening and slow. Um, I, I'm sure many people are familiar with how frightening it can be when you leave school and you don't have a job. That was me, and so I did a master's degree, and then I still didn't have a job. In fact, I didn't play very well uh, because uh, when I was seven. I tripped and fell in a construction area and tore a hole in my lip. Mm. And uh, so for the longest time, this was the center of my embouchure. And uh, I decided to switch my embouchure back to the center um, after I had finished my undergrad. So um, embouchure changes aren't fast. And I left my master's not sounding good, not having a lot of uh, job prospects beyond private teaching and it was very scary um, but I kept at it and uh, things that eventually happened uh, if you want to backtrack a little bit truthfully I was a jazz trombone player I, I didn't have the patience for youth orchestra okay. um, there's a lot of counting rests while string players practice and they, they just have tons more notes than we do in a Tchaikovsky symphony so I played jazz trombone and I had a great time, um, but I decided that um, I would switch to classical when I was uh, 18, maybe 17, and uh, it took me about two or three years to, to reset my decoder wheel, as it were. And uh, so when that happened, um, things started to develop, and, and uh, I was at Indiana um, for my undergrad, and I uh, was in a, the top orchestra in the top position playing out of the side, <laughs> and in the middle of my senior year, terrible breakup with my girlfriend, I was like, okay, I'm just going to start over, and it's going to be right here, and we'll see how long it takes. And it took two years to feel normal, and it took six years, no, it took two years to sound normal, six years to feel normal. Wow. Um, it, it wasn't fast, and um, but I, I ended up uh, winning a job anyway, and uh what I tell my students is that most, especially at NEC, the, the students that I see are far more talented, even auditioning, uh, than, uh, than I ever was when I was 20. Because at 20, I could barely make it through a, a Bordoni Roshu. Wow. Because I had no endurance and I, I couldn't get it through with a clear buzz. Uh, and the talent that I hear uh, from students that are auditioning for me is so far beyond what I had as far as ability uh, and, and technique. Um, but I figured it out and just from hard work. So um, I, get, I get really excited about what I see uh, insofar as talent with my students because I know uh, that it just comes down to hard work. And I love being a part of that. You really have to keep your eye on the prize. That's all. Sounds like some great sound advice for a lot of people that found themselves in a similar situation. You know, you graduate undergrad, oh, what now? Graduate school, then you graduate graduate school, and oh, really, what now? So, 
hard work. That's that, that's a the, secret, huh? <laughs> well, that and a cutoff date. You know, and and I I realize that maybe this is uh, far from the minds of uh, eighteen, nineteen year old uh, young adults, but uh, you set a cutoff date where uh, you don't want to be a mouse waiting for crumbs to fall from the giant's table, and uh, my cutoff date was thirty, where I was going to stop playing trombone and say, okay, it wasn't in the cards, I was going to go be a paramedic. And, and I had it, like, all in my mind that, like, when I get to 30, I'm not going to I'm not gonna have any regrets. Just, all right, that's done. wasn't in the cards. I'm going to go on to something else. Uh, and, and that uh, gave me a different way of practicing, especially when you're 20, thinking, even if you're thinking about to 30, that's 10 years. If you don't figure out technique, something, you know, articulation, slide technique today, it's okay. You know, you've got 10 more years. But... At 24, you start thinking, oh, my God, this might not happen. I mean, especially after you leave school, you're like, God, what, what if it doesn't happen? And um, having a cutoff date actually gave me um, uh, a lot more inspiration to practice and, and relief. Like I was practicing towards either I was, I was going to stop playing trombone and have be relieved that way or I was going to win a job and, and be relieved that way. And these two things I was, I was going for it um, to sort of – uh, give me more impetus to practice in the first place. More, you know, I'm going to get better today. I'm going to get better today to make a conscious choice every time you play. Like, are you really doing everything you can? I mean, that's that's what I was practicing with uh, after I changed my armature, and I think that that meant more than anything else. Amazing. So we kind of went through the timeline where you started. We went through school, um, but something we didn't really talk about is. How did you approach the audition process? Because it's one thing to be really good, mm. but it's another thing to win a job. Right. So uh, when I was inexperienced, I felt that the truth of the matter is, is the best player is hired for any job. You show up and you look around at the field and you're like, uh, I'm not sure if I am the best player. But that's not actually what happens. The best player for the job wins. So that... I noticed that it it wasn't always who I thought it would be. I mean, you hear what people sound like at an audition. You hear somebody play, you just want to go home. But that person ends up not winning the job. You're like, huh, I wonder what's wrong with the committee. Well, the committee ends up hiring somebody, and after a couple of years, they get tenure. Like, huh, I guess that person can actually play? Or, look, the committee's looking for the best player for that job. And who that is every day is not something for you to know. Um, it, it's not actually fair to try to second guess the committee for your own playing and then also for um, anybody else. And so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, although it's about as fair a way to, to win a job, it's still not perfect. And uh, you got to look at it like walking on to a, a chess game that's already in progress okay. and you know clearly one side is winning and another isn't and you have a choice to play the game as well as you can or walk away and if you walk away you have to be okay with the fact that somebody else is going to win that game and it could have been your game but you don't know so there's people that go to auditions and they complain about the fact that it was set up unfair or something happened that was out of their control like you, you arrive at the at the at the audition city and you check into your hotel and all night you you're out on the street because there was a fire drill. This happens. I've heard of it happen. It hasn't really happened to me, but things like that happen. Sure. And at any one point, you can choose to stop playing the game. And you know you can actually play the audition having already checked out. And what I found is uh, approaching the audition process successfully was a choice moment by moment to stay in the game, even though it might not be fair, even though it might not be perfect. You're there, you're going to play as well as you can to the best of your abilities, and when they tell you to go home, that's when you give up. A lot of the times I have these really talented students, colleagues, friends uh, who are taking auditions and they they count themselves out well before it's time 
and uh, or they try to second guess whether they're uh, going to win the job or not. And just you have a choice to stay in the game as long as you can. It may not be perfect. Complain about it tomorrow, not today. That's uh, the way that I approach auditions is like uh, to try to be as scientific as possible. I definitely sit down and take notes. What did I do wrong? What did I do right? Uh, right after the audition, I think it was really helpful advice from John Swallow. I've got stacks of audition packets that I've made where the back page is me just like feverishly writing 30, 40 minutes after the audition from the clarity that I have. Just like, God, if I could just turn the clock back two weeks, I would know. <laughs> this could have gone so much better. Maybe I would have even won or at least made it to the next round. You know, I got to stay hydrated. You're flying. Flying dehydrates you. Okay, I got to do that for next time. And, you know, that, 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 that there is a next time that you choose to play the game the next time is why you, you write, uh, you know, what you're going to do different than it. So that, in, in so far as that part, it's very scientific. And the, the preparation, uh, that's the other part that I want to, say is very important that, uh, I mean, of course, everybody says prepare, but nothing really helped me as much as two things. One is to play every piece from start to finish with my favorite recording, count every rest, play every note several times just to get the style right. Okay. And usually the people that I would, especially when I was in school, uh, they were great players, but they were not on par with the orchestra that I was trying to get into. Um, so, I would get a recording of, of uh, you know, New York Philharmonic or Chicago Symphony or San Francisco Symphony or Boston Symphony, Cleveland Orchestra, Vienna Philharmonic. There's a really great recording. Get down tempo, get down style, get down note shape, length, short, long, whatever. And then the other thing that's really helpful is slow it down, half tempo. Make sure every detail is intact at half tempo, three quarters tempo, and all the way to tempo uh, pitch. The, the thing is, you just can't get past the three T's. Time, tune, tone. There's no substitute. You, I mean, stylistically, there are excerpts like Bolero, uh, Mahler 3, that you can win based purely on style. You can win your job based on how stylistically engaging your phrasing is. But then there's other excerpts like Die Valkyra and Hungarian March and William Tell. If you play the best William Tell ever. It's more like a check. He or she can do that. It's not like, wow, that was the best one of the day. Let's just give him the job now. But that kind of stuff happens when you play Bolero. So, so you're trying to get the style right is really important, and that's why I say you got to just play through the recording. Uh, so, you know, maybe a couple of different recordings to know a piece upside down and sideways, count every rest. The other thing that you got to do is slow it down so that you can make sure the three T's, time, tune, tone, are intact no matter what. Yeah. And then, then there's the chess game part. There's some really great advice in there. That's a, that's a wealth of, it, of information. Thank you. Um, but, okay, so now we've won the audition. And th this is the kind of the area where people don't really know much more about the intricacies of what goes on. Once you're in a top orchestra, what are your daily challenges? You know, is there section blending problems, or what do you encounter on a daily basis? Well, um, I think the, the most significant thing that you have to overcome is um, recognizing that you're in a new country. In fact, uh, many people travel abroad. Uh, you don't want to be the uh, dumb American that goes to Paris and wonders why nobody speaks English. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're not going to complain enough that the entire country says, oh my God, you're right. We should speak English for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, people are going to put up with your complaining and they're going to speak French to you and you're going to have to figure out how to speak some rudimentary phrases in French. And the longer you stay in France, the better it is for you to learn the customs, the native customs, and, and try to fit in. Every orchestra has its own culture, and I've played in several, and they've all been different. There's been things that you never, ever, ever say in, <laughs> in any professional situation, but it gets very idiosyncratic to the, the situation 
when you go to one orchestra to another, it's, it's different from one place to another. And to know what that is means you have to open your eyes, and close your mouth, open your ears, listen, watch, listen, watch, just observe. A well-crafted question is going to help you so much more than telling everybody you know your resume. So let your work speak for itself and then be available to learn a new culture. And it's exciting, you know, when you learn that you get to reinvent yourself. Uh, you, you have all these ideas of what you're going to do when you win your first job, and there you go. You got it. Living wage, health insurance, make it happen. Retirement package, probably, yeah. Go out there. What are you going to do with your life? Okay, you're going to be the best trombonist. Okay, then what? You know, because that, that's not going to make you entirely happy. It would probably make you a lot happy, but, you know, th th there's, there's other things too. And yeah. um, I think you have a responsibility for that and to be able to, to have the freedom to decide that um, is it's, it's out of the box for the way a lot of students think, and justifiably so. I mean, you, you, you probably in, in music school, you should allow the trombone to consume most, if not all, of your life, just to try to make sure you're, you're giving it everything you've got. You get your job, and, and uh, you need to learn the new culture. So I think that's the most significant thing that uh, some, people, some people overlook, because the truth is, coming from school, we, we tend to idealize ourselves a bit. Um, we, we tend to idealize life and you get to your first gig and there is not an idealistic situation. Never, never has everything been how I visualized it being perfect in music school. And that's not good or bad. It just is. And, uh, and again, like we were talking about with auditions, if you, if you complain about the fact that things aren't perfect, especially when you're on probation, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, your job is to fit in. In fact, everybody, especially uh, if you're uh, if you're joining a, a brass section that uh, is is diverse in ability, uh, you're expected not only to play your part well, but to make the the brass section look good, look and sound better than before you were there. And if all you do is play your part as well as possible, and then complain about potential weak links. Um, this is not going to help you, and uh, it's not going to help anybody, and you will not get tenure. And there's plenty of examples of, uh, historically, that I can think of, of, of that happening. And uh, it's, it's better, actually, to uh, take time and, and figure out how to be the best colleague possible insofar as playing and insofar as what you have to offer culturally to the people around you so that uh, everybody wins. You can figure out a way to make everybody look and sound better than before you got there. Not just your part, but everybody. Yeah. This, this is, is really a trick that is not taught very well in music school because the tricky part for this is the second that people feel like you don't respect them, that relationship is over, especially if you're on probation. And... Um, for myself, I mean, I, I touched on the fact that I changed my embouchure. And uh, so I went through a really rough patch. And the rough patch lasted longer than a year. It lasted longer than two years. In fact, it was three years before I felt like I could get through Bolero with any consistency. Um, so it was a rough patch, and I had to work through it. And there were people during that time that wrote me off, and there were other people that didn't. And those people that didn't made me into who I am now. And, uh, and I remembered what it felt like to be written off by people whose help I really needed. Um, sometimes it happens on the job. People go through rough spots, rough spots. And if they feel like you devalue them, um, that's the end of that relationship. And it's, you've actually lost a tremendous resource. Typically, there's a great deal of knowledge to be gained from somebody with experience in the orchestra that you're living. So I think, I think that uh, what I would say is uh, not everything that you have to learn is, um, 
is how to be a better player. That learning how to operate in the culture that this weird orchestral environment that we've chosen as a vocation um, it, it, it's it's not something that you know right off the bat right out of uh, and your ability to to learn and adapt quickly to new information is what's going to make you smart not not uh, intelligence actually it's what you don't know that makes you smart <laughs> right <laughs> It's the paradox of life. Well, there's it's that's some powerful insight. Uh, it, it's easy to forget. We all were so focused on instrument, 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 and uh, we can forget about we're making music with the people around us. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap it up, let's go and do some quick fun questions. So, okay. number one, what's your favorite food? Favorite food? It actually, you you sent this question ahead of time, and I <laughs> I've been agonizing over it because it's uh, <laughs> that's Good. a difficult answer. I am a food tourist. Every time I go to a new country, new town, I want to know what the food tastes like. You know that they've been eating in that area. In particular, to China, I really like having Chinese food in China because if you think about it, this cuisine has been developing over the last two to five thousand years. And so when you go in to have soup and it's got chicken feet in it, you're like, at first, everybody like, whoa, chicken feet, that's different. <laughs> okay. But my question is, really, why? What do you put in it? How come? Tell me why. You know, of course, you know, they're like, we don't speak English. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, uh, but what you find is like uh, chicken feet, they actually have a lot of flavor. Uh, it's it's the flavor density is much greater than you find in uh, for example chicken breast. So um, one plate that I had that I just could never get enough of was big plate chicken, and it was when I was in Lanzhou uh, a few years ago, and the place that I went to eat it in was like um, it didn't even look like a restaurant. And in the back, there was, you know, somebody with a, a ginormous wok, and they just make this broth, and they cook the, they put the whole chicken in there with potatoes and vegetables, and it's really spicy. But they cook it until everything's just kind of broken apart. You know, at one point, I'm like, I'm eating, and like, wow, that's the foot. Okay, I kind of eat around some, some bones, and it's totally cool to just kind of spit out the bones, and... And then, and then, oh, this is this is the head and all parts therein, you know. It's like, okay, this is all part of the flavor, but it was the most complicated meal I've ever had, and I just could not stop eating. It was so good, and and I've never had that feeling where, where it just like I couldn't stop. I just couldn't stop. It was so amazing every bite. So beyond that, a, a distant second would be sushi. I really enjoy sushi a lot um and uh and coffee <laughs> it's a primary food of all of us yes oh, that was a great answer actually i really want to try that dish now you, you sold it well <laughs> no no if you can find it I, it's it's actually like i think i need to go back to the place that made it um which i <laughs> I need to find out. We had a guide with me the whole time, Jay Chen. We both had the the same experience. We're looking at each other like, seriously, can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number two: What is your most memorable performance? Uh, most memorable for performance. Well, that um, can be good or bad. Yeah. No. Um, <sighs> So I'm playing Mahler 6, and it's my second week on the job, and I was sweating bullets. I was really nervous, and I remember there was probably two nights in a row in preparation for this concert that I just didn't sleep. I was so nervous and started to calm down. I, you know, like the, the music always rescues me, and so like I'd gone through it with the recording enough that... that uh, that like once we start playing, it's almost like a relief. I'm relaxed, okay. And there's this uh, there's this lick that uh, the trombones or the first trombone has in the first movement. Right. So um, we we play we we read it down. Everything goes well. And and James Levine, he's 
the guy that hired me, and he's conducting Mahler 6, and it, everything's going fantastic. And he goes, yeah, Tobe. Um, call me Tobe. I love that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he goes, that part right there, it's, it's Mark 3S, but I, I want you to bury the orchestra there. And I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> I, I will do my best. I will do this. Okay. So um, we get ready for the... Uh, for the concert, you know, we, we started, you know, it's very visceral, shoom, 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 shoom. it's just, you know, primitive. And when Levine would conduct, he would get this grip right at the front of every note, just the way that he, he got the orchestra to, to grip this primitive music was intense. And, and so we're just going to ride this wave, and, and, uh, and, and again, second week on the job, I'm so excited. I feel like I'm going to just lift right out of the chair. And I'm trying to like stay down, keep myself calmed down. And, and uh, the, the part's coming up. And I think, okay, we're in the concert now. I've got to remember what he asked me for here. And, um, you know, the Doug, he's got this descending, da, dig it all, bug it all. You know, like, okay, da, ba, da, da, ba, da, ba, ba, da, ba, ba, da, okay. And then I, I put my horn up to play, and just to make sure that nothing funny is happening with the tempo, I look up at the podium, and Jimmy was waiting for my eyes. And he's got this devilish grin on his face, and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I go, oh my god! I can't. <laughs> it was like I had a split second to say, okay, that could be the thing that makes me really mess this up. <laughs> this could be an enormous clam, and and I just took a, as deep a breath as I could, and I just nailed it. And you know, I got the first note out of the phrase, and I knew that I could just like follow the air right behind it. But it was like that moment when like I. He didn't have to do that for me to like to know what he what he wanted me to do. I mean, just him saying in the rehearsal would have been enough. But I was I was like, <laughs> the fact that he was making eye contact with me. Not only that, but just like the you know right here. <laughs> uh, just I'm never gonna forget that. It's just like you know, thank God I didn't screw that up. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Last quick fun question. Um, obviously, you're probably the hero to many players, uh, and but everyone has their own personal heroes. So I was wondering, who are some of yours? Uh, well, definitely my dad. Um, there's a there's a vigorous endurance that my dad has lived his life, and um, I I could never keep up. Like my dad ran ten miles a day, every day without fail. From the time I was born, like before I was born, he would he he never stopped. He and when I say ten miles a day, I mean around five ten five twenty mile pace. Um, I could never. I, I can't. I I don't do that now. I mean, I exercise. Don't get me wrong, but like the the level of intensity that was that was just one thing that he did in a day where he's working. Like he had a full time job teaching, and and then he it, sorry teaching beginning band, and then he would come home and he would teach. It was by the time I got to junior high, he had enough lessons that it was another forty hours a week. So he had two full time jobs, and he would run ten miles a day. And and it was uh, I I just I still think about that like and, and marvel um, at that level of intensity. Um, it was just like he he had energy to burn. He still has energy to burn. Um, so definitely my dad. He's like the Energizer Bunny. Um, exercising at that level of intensity definitely he he aged really slowly from that. And I'm trying to uh, tap that a little bit, but um, you know, definitely having trouble keeping up with that. Um, yeah, uh, I think probably uh, some teachers that I had that I idolized would be um, John Swallow, um, very practical-minded teacher, um, 
very, very, very musical. His his whole way of teaching was to try to solve technical issues that you're having on the trombone through music. So whenever I would talk about having a technical problem with uh, getting through a piece, we we would solve it with better phrase te- technique, better better phrase architecture. Um, and the thing is, like, uh, I didn't really get to te- get lessons from him. He, he didn't start teaching me until I was in Florida. I was just happy that he ended up retiring in Sarasota, which is where my first full-time gig was. And, and so after I'd been there for a year or so, I, I looked him up for lessons, and it was extremely creative and fresh uh, how he approached teaching. Uh, and uh, the... <sighs> You know, you ever have a, the experience that, like you're you're getting somebody else's lesson from a teacher, uh, where like you're just getting boilerplate. You know, this is something you've said fifty thousand times, and I'm fifty thousand and one. Yeah. Yep. I I never ever had that experience with John, and uh, and he he ended up being my my surrogate grandfather and uh, in in Florida and. Just after a while, instead of uh, taking lessons, we'd just hang out pretty much every afternoon. You know, like, what are we going to do today? I don't know. Let's let's go see Master and Commander. Go watch a movie. <laughs> that is that is what we would do. <laughs> I didn't have kids at the time, and my wife was working, so we we're just like, well, I don't know. We got the afternoon free. What are we going to do today? And and it was a really, um, it was a really great relationship, and and he had very practical uh, solutions always to um, to my problems that didn't seem to be rife with idealistic jargon. And it's just like, okay, well, what do we need to do for you? And we, literally, we built a tooth for me because I had a gap. I was like, God, it, it feels like when I play Bolero more than once, like, it feels like I'm wearing shorts on wicker furniture. <laughs> and, and he said, really? And I said, yeah, it, it hurts. And uh, and so he looked at it, he found this like gap right here where, uh, right where the rim of my mouthpiece goes. And he's like, well, let, let's see what we can do. And he went into his garage and he brought out bonding material that he'd gotten from his dentist. And he like made a tooth and then like, like ground it down with like 300 count sound paper sandpaper and and then i mean i i went actually to the dentist and got permanent bonding put in but <laughs> there, was, there was about 10 years that i had this tooth that i would keep in a in an, in a jewelry case in my in my trombone case and i'd like pull it out and just go right there and, wow. and that's how i'd play every every time whether i was warming up or playing a concert it's like this little tooth um i should probably say one more um I, truthfully, I idolize the people that I sit with. Um, uh, every every person that I sit near, uh, from Mike Roy Lance, Jim, of course, Steve, Tom Rolfs, Tom Siders, Ben Wright, Mike Martin. I, I'm, I feel so lucky, and I literally learn from what they do and how they approach their job just watching and that I get to be surrounded by such amazing colleagues is a gift. I am surrounded by my heroes and I'm not trying to like blow smoke, hot air. <laughs> like These people are, are celebrated already without me saying that I am telling you sitting close to them. I get to sit closer to them than anybody else. And it's a gift it, they are amazing people, um, and and I learn from them as one would from their hero every day. It's a gift. Great. Well, let's wrap things up. I don't know if you have any sponsors you want to shout out to. Mm, sure. Uh, good people at Edwards. Kristen Griego. Make sure you say it right. It's Kristen Griego. I messed it up for like 10 years, not Christian, Kristen. I've, I've definitely been messing it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's, he's so nice. He never corrects anybody. Um, he's been helping me my whole trombone career. And he's so supportive and uh, affable. Uh, and I feel really good about the trombone. I'm 
I play on right now, I, I feel like I can trust it in a way that uh, I've never been able to trust equipment before. And uh, it's, it's because of his help. So um, I, would, I would definitely... I'm, I play on Edward's stuff, and me saying this right now, I'm not getting any money to say it. I'm just like, uh, I feel the relationship that Kristen... Kristen, I just screwed it up. I feel like the relationship that Kristen sponsors or fosters in the trombone community. We need more of this, and um, I'm really happy working with him. Great. Well, Toby, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you today, and uh, it was really fun. Thank you so much. Likewise, sir. It's been a pleasure for me too. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. It is hopefully one of many to come. If you enjoy content like this, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you haven't already, please check out my blog. I linked it in the comments below. Thanks again so much to Toby Oft for doing this interview, and I'll catch everyone next time.